Welcome to the Biomedical Frontiers podcast, where we explore pivotal research projects and disruptive innovations aimed at translating scientific advancements into tangible healthcare solutions. I'm your host, Dasha Tischler. I loved research, but as an undergrad, didn't get super excited about the topic until I landed in a lab that was doing muscle biomechanics and modeling. And I was pretty much just hooked from then on. What are some things that you've learned studying them so deeply that you want, you would want everybody in the world to know about their muscles? Well, you should use them. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are, are, are on the pioneering edge of applying mm -hmm. artificial intelligence in medical applications. Right. And what is sort of the, the vision that you have for AI in Springbok? You log in and you can see your own, you actually see like a visualization of your own musculature. So that presented an opportunity for us to say, okay, can we adapt our AI to work off of that type of image to quantify those muscles in the way that the clinician would? This is one of those things that's so different about being in the startup world, how quickly technology can be developed. Most of the edge of knowledge was based on studies done on men. Can you describe what the essence of the problem is? A woman isn't just a small man, and, and that's how modeling has assumed it. We need to solve that because um, there's so many things about our physiology that we know are different. Welcome back to Biomedical Frontiers, Stories with Innovators in Healthcare. On today's episode, we have Dr. Sylvia Blumker, who is a professor of biomedical engineering at University of Virginia School of Engineering, and she's an expert in biomechanics and computational modeling. She's also the founder and chief science officer of Springbok Analytics, where she uses MRI data to create real-time modeling of muscle functions for the whole human body. She's a fellow with the American Institute of Medical and Biological Engineering, as well as the American Society for Biomechanics. Her M3 lab at University of Virginia uses imaging, experimental methods, as well as modeling in order to study muscles and their functions. She's also an advocate for women in healthcare, women in engineering, as well as for including more women in biomedical study and for better differentiating between male and female physiology in research. Welcome to the show, Dr. Blumker. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. Well, there's so many things for us to discuss, but first, I want to learn a little bit about your personal journey and how you became an expert in biomechanics and muscle biology. Awesome. Um, so um, personal journey, I'll just start. Um, I was born and raised in Lawrence, Kansas. Both of my parents were professors, immigrants from Argentina, and my dad was a mathematician. So from a young age, like sort of math had to be in what we did. Um, but also my parents um, instilled pretty early on the concept of finding something that you love and doing that. Um, so finding a passion uh, for your work, like that, that was something that I was pursuing pretty early on. And so uh, at that time, uh, when I was deciding where to go to college, um, I knew I liked math. Um, I had to, <laughs> but also I was really fascinated by the human body and um, thought medical school would be cool maybe. And, but maybe I, I don't think I'm the right personality for a doctor necessarily. And I think my parents saw the writing on the wall on that before I did, but they, we learned about this, uh, new field called biomedical engineering that I'd never heard of. I graduated from high school in 1993. So there were just a few programs out there. Um, there were people at UVA actually at that time already doing biomedical engineering, uh, which is cool. But, um, and uh, just sounded perfect for me, the idea of mixing uh, my interest in, in biology and the human body with um, math and physics, just that like that kind of got me hooked. And so uh, I went to Northwestern uh, to, to study biomedical engineering as an undergrad. And uh, I had a few research experiences that um, I loved research, but I didn't, uh, as an undergrad, didn't get super excited about the topic until I landed in a lab that was doing muscle biomechanics and modeling. And I was pretty much just hooked from then on. I was an undergraduate student working on an undergrad research project uh, with a graduate student at that time, who now that person is one of my best friends, actually. Um, she's also a professor of biomedical engineering. Um, and and um, yeah, I think it's just such a cool mix of things. I grew up as a dancer and um, just, you know, was fascinated by movement in that way. And 
just have always thought it was a it's a really cool mix of of um, fascinating things, um, really like lots of new ways to innovate, but then also working on problems that that really are important to the world. And I read that you actually studied with both mechanical engineering and biomedical engineering. Can you compare sort of the differences in how education and, and training is pursued on those two engineering disciplines and what you're doing to get you, what sort of each of them taught you? Oh, yeah, that's, that's a great question. So, um, so yeah, I kind of have gone back and forth because uh, since my research is biomechanics, so my undergrad and master's degrees are in biomedical engineering. And then I did my PhD in mechanical engineering at Stanford. And um, in that training, so I, so I found, you know, I think it's, um, there's a lot of overlap. And, you know, there's a general overarching idea of, of an engineering training that I, I think actually supersedes all of it. The idea of problem solving, critical thinking, um, uh, and also research in that area, you know, pursuit of questions and how you answer Being them. methodical. Yeah, learning things on your own. So I think actually those, they're more similar than different because of that overarching concept. But in terms of specifically the training and, and the philosophy, I would say, um, you know, in BME, we think about it as biology first. And then in the mechanical engineering side, it would be the the physics first or the engineering part first. And then that's the application to biology versus in BME, it's sort of like we're fascinated by the biology, then we bring in engineering tools to explore that and solve problems related to that. So it's kind of like what's the what's the core uh, fascination really and interest is I think the distinguisher, though, you know, it's still kind of gray. <laughs> and do you have students from uh, mechanical engineering, biomedical in your lab as well? Um, right now, all of my students are biomedical engineering students. I have had uh, mechanical engineering students in the past. So, um, you know, and, and honestly, if you looked at their PhD th theses, you wouldn't tell the difference. So in, in the end, like, I think, especially for a PhD, you become so it's it's all about your own contribution. And, you know, they both they all use engineering principles and, and you know, they're great contributions to the field. So in the end with the research, I think it's, I don't know, they, they're quite similar, I guess. One of the things you mentioned is that when you were starting out, biomedical engineering was a very nascent discipline. And one of the reasons we have this podcast, Biomedical Frontiers, in the first place is because biomedical engineering is still a relatively nascent discipline. And it's certainly one that's expanding rapidly. So that concept that we can be on the frontier of something in a lot of different areas in biomedical engineering. So I want to kind of backtrack a little bit, like, what have you seen as the evolution of the field in general and uh, training in the field uh, for the last 10, 20 years? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd say I'll start with the training part. Uh, when I when I started, and I think most and there weren't that many BME programs at that point, but I think most of them were similar in the sense of the way the training felt was, okay, you're BME, but you're really essentially one of the other disciplines: mechanical engineering, electrical, chemical, computer, uh, and then with a few BME classes on top. So I was mechanical because I you know love mechanics, and so. As a BME student, I took a lot of classes in mechanical engineering. And then, of course, I had physiology, and it was quantitative physiology. Like most BME programs teach our own physiology because we have a quantitative engineering slant to it. And other biology and things like that, I had to take all the classes pre-meds did. But so it was definitely like the training was essentially happened in other department disciplines. Um, also, we we ended up feeling a little bit like jack-of-all-trades because we would have to take so I focused on mechanics, but then I had to take circuits and I had to take thermodynamics and in all the other departments. And so um, it did feel like a lot of people would say when we came out of our training, people didn't really know what we knew because <laughs> we just knew a lot of a lot of things. And, you know, but still, I think even back then it came down to like you have an engineering training and you uh, it's a very challenging program. So getting through it and is is a kind of milestone that I think prepares you for a lot of things. But it is true back then, most mo most companies didn't really, you know, there weren't many internship opportunities or real paths to um, to a clear like uh, job that would really leverage the specific training we had. Um, I've and that's definitely 
changed uh, a lot since then. I think two things have changed. The BME programs are now much more defined as their own thing. We teach most, we have core classes that start at the beginning, you know, in the second year. So we're not telling students to go to all these other departments to take classes first. We train them in all the core things. And I think in that, um, especially UVA BME is to find this biology first is really a mantra. So our students are really um, trained well in, in, in modern biology, which is obviously a, a field that's changing rapidly. So, um, and uh, then also a lot of kind of modern things like something called systems biology, which is, you know, the application of data science and modeling to biology. And um, that's a pretty um, emerging area of, of BME that our students get a really good training on that. And so for that reason, now there's many opportunities for for people trained in biomedical engineering, obviously, you know, in academia, but then because there's a lot of people that don't want to study it, <laughs> which is great. But then also in, in industry, whether that's from biotech or biomedical device or, you know, general healthcare industry, even at a lot of the government labs and the military, there's a lot of opportunities. Um, so, I mean, human health is kind of across the board. And I think the world now sees that a biomedical engineer has a real opportunity to kind of contribute. So, I guess that's the other thing is I see a lot of new opportunities for students now, albeit oftentimes students feel like they might need some postgraduate training to get the kind of job that they want. Um, if they want to start in a in a company, maybe not at the like the very bottom, then then they might need a master's or a Ph.D. to kind of get them to a, a place where they're kind of most excited. But um, but yeah. Well, one of the things I know from my uh, undergraduate degree and studying biomedical engineering was just that we had opportunities also to collaborate, go into the clinic, go mm -hmm. into the hospital, see procedures, much more so than I, I think in many other disciplines, you might not necessarily, you know, maybe you get that one tour of right. a plane being built or something mm -hmm. like that. So is collaboration sort of also at the heart of biomedical engineering? Is that something that's evolved over time as, as you've seen the industry evolve? Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I love that for sure. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of defined as a, as an interdisciplinary, you're, you're merging engineering, biology, and medicine, like kind of the definition of, of biomedical engineering is that way. So, and um, you know, the, the UVA department is actually, I, you know, one of a very select few of programs that has, has that real connection between medical school and engineering and actually not only um, administratively, but like uh, geographically, we're, we're actually sitting right next to the hospital. And so that gives these students the opportunity to have that exposure um, and see what it's like to do those collaborations and understand there's a lot that goes into it, both from the technical side of understanding enough of the engineering that you can, that you have the ability and the confidence to bring that to the table with a collaborator, but then also how to do the communication, the other skills that some people call them soft skills, but I heard uh, someone else, I, I'm not the inventor of this, but call them power skills uh, in terms of communication and teamwork and understanding that those play a really key role in, in um, you know, working with clinicians and, and leveraging your expertise and, and interest to, to help make a difference there. So let's dive in into some of your research and your recent work. First of all, I want to talk about Springbok Analytics. Is uh -huh. there a history behind the name? Yes, yes. So um, Springbok, a startup company that I co-founded with uh, one of my colleagues in BME, Craig Meyer, and then another colleague who was in kinesiology, uh, Joe Hart. So we founded Springbok, which is um, commercializing technology we developed to go from MRI to quantification of muscle and through modeling. And um, our first, uh, com you know, our first direction with that company was in elite sports and sort of thinking about how this technology could be used to enable human performance, uh, help athletes recover from injury or kind of reach maximal potential. So we kind of had the idea of naming it after like a very you know, an animal that had really good uh, uh, kind of performance skills. And so the springbok is an, is an antelope that's very fast, very agile. And so we thought, so that, that's kind I of where it started. That. Yeah. And, it, you know, it's always one of those, like we were, well, we started with a grant, writing a grant. And so then we had to start the company. And so then we needed a name. And it was kind of like one of those last, last 
and you know we're in the middle of the night emailing back and forth ideas and this is where it landed so well it's a beautiful kind of name stuck. and you get a mascot all in one right so. exactly so you started the company with a focus on elite performance but it sounds like now you might be uh expanding that into other areas mm -hmm. can you talk a little bit about kind of what started where you saw the first opportunities and how those applications evolved that is a good question. So, um, you know, when we started the concept, like on the research side, funded by culture, uh, by the Culture Foundation, um, was actually um, not in elite sports or human performance. We had a first interest in developing something to help in management of treatments for uh, children with cerebral palsy. That was the first application we had in mind that came, first grant that we wrote was about that. And um then through, so we were, you know, thanks to culture, this is why we're here. Um, we uh, started in that. We started um, kind of developing the technology, actually first in in, in uh, healthy individual can kind of control subjects and then moved on to children with cerebral palsy. And then the Culture Foundation is the one that encouraged us to think more broadly because we knew that there were a lot of applications. In fact, I actually just revisited um the first slide deck that we made for our first culture, the Culture Foundation makes us do these uh, presentations when we're applying for a grant. And I was curious and I was actually telling some people, so actually the current employees at, at Springbox has grown really quickly about the history, like where it came from. It's, it's nice for people to kind of hear that. So I'm like, oh, let me just pull this up and see what we said. It was actually, um, I was kind of impressed by us because we <laughs> we had, I had the slide about like the the uh, articulating the need that we're, you know, trying to, um, to fulfill. And, you know, we had essentially what are the applications and it was from, you know, neuromuscular disorders, but, uh, muscle disease. So that we're in that area. Um, uh, another one was aging populations, which is that something that we're, is on our horizon. The list of applications, that we even at the beginning, even though we were focused on cerebral palsy, we had listed were all things that are, are relevant. Um, so, um, but yeah, so we, the culture, you know, when you're thinking about trying to have an impact through commercialization, you have to think about market and how big it is. That's the only, that's the only way you could, you can make it work because you have to have a market and you have to have a market that uh, it doesn't take too long or too much effort to kind of get into. And so the elite sports made a made a real it was a natural direction just because, um, you know, in terms of cost, it's less sensitive. There's a lot of barriers that exist um, in the traditional healthcare space that don't exist in, in human performance. And so that that was the natural place to start. So. Uh, you started with the kind of elite, but you already saw that there are many disease indications that you might be able to treat this, to use this for treatment, diagnostics. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk about just one example of uh, maybe in the more healthcare or wellness oriented, what is it like for the patient and the provider kind of before Springbok Analytics, what they have available to them? And then with Springbok Analytics, what kind of information, like what, what are they getting that, what are the insights information they're getting? Um, yes. So, um, it's, you know, the key thing is they're getting very detailed, kind of never before seen information about their muscle health. And so that's really where we're focused and really addressing the need that it's very hard to know what's going on in your muscles. Um, cause for the most part, the way that we have to understand the health of our muscles is general body, like how how much we weigh mm -hmm. and uh, our and our our performance, our function. But that really is really from the outside perspective. And there's so much going on inside the body that we have no ability to to really discern because there's so much more on the inside than there you can see on the outside. You know, one simple example, let's say we're talking about the knee and we're thinking about rebuilding, like let's say you had an injury or a surgery and you're trying to rehab your your um your quads, let's say your knee, the strength of your knee. Well, there's multiple muscles that cross the knee. So it's not just one muscle. There's actually four muscles under there. One of those muscles does more than just act at the knee. Um, you also have the muscles on the other side of the leg that could be contributing. There's another more than four back there. So there's a lot of muscles in there. And but we only really see the outcome of all of that interacting. So it's really hard to know which muscles 
are contributing to whatever impairment that you have. And, and it turns out like there's actually the ways to target individual muscles. You just have to know which ones need targeting. So that's really what we provide is that detailed information, the inside view. Each single, we get this report that um, essentially provides us, we've developed something called the Springbok score, um, which there's a history behind that that I could go into, but essentially tell somebody a score of their muscle and a score of 50 is like a typical what you uh, would expect and higher means like bigger, stronger, lower means weaker, smaller. Um, we also pr provide information about, um, it's called fat infiltration. So how much muscle is really inside your muscle. Mm -hmm. um, and then we also uh, provide measures of asymmetry. So comparing your right and left, which for many applications um, is really valuable because it's, let's say you've injured yourself on one side. So now you have a really strong asymmetry. One side is kind of much stronger than the other and trying to equalize things because that's potential propensity for injury if you're preferring one over the other. So um, those are all the types of things that we can provide that right now there would, there's really no way to do that on a muscle by muscle level. And you mentioned also one of the metrics that you're able to look at is the fat cells in the muscle. Mm -hmm. What's some of the, uh, how is that research going to be applicable to maybe some of this other research we're seeing around um, diabetes, heart disease? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, uh, you know, a young, uh, young, uh, um, I say young because I feel like I'm getting older. So <laughs> saying the word young it has much more and more meaning to me. Um, a healthy, younger muscle um, will look pretty much it won't have little, if any, fat within it. Like it'll be completely look inside the muscle, pretty much 95 percent muscle and then maybe 5% uh, like connective tissue, essentially it's the, you know, gluing all the muscle fibers together so they work well together. But then, um, you know, a natural process as we age, we um, fat actually, um, it's called fat infiltration, kind of finds its way in their muscle. There's a lot of interesting biology behind how that happens that we could go into, but um, that happens. It also happens if you've injured a muscle pretty badly. Mm. Uh, the, Fat infiltration can happen as a result of that. Um, and then in, in a lot of different muscle diseases, it can happen. I think in um, anything that um, any metabolic issue, like you, you can, it can happen in diabetes and other, in other populations as well. Um, so obviously, you know, from a simple standpoint of how functional is a muscle, if you've taken a muscle and you've taken out let's say half of the muscle fibers that are the things that you need to generate force and you've replaced them with fat, of course, that muscle is about half as weak. Those are some interesting questions about that too. But anyways, um, uh, so one of the you know main functional issue is that you just have less function, less motor in there to work. So your muscle, even though maybe it looks big enough, is not functioning at that level. Um, but then there's also interesting, um, it's kind of a biomarker of perhaps disease progression. That's something that I think is a, uh, now is an emerging as a, as a, another really important application of our technology of helping either study the progression of disease or help to tell if, a, if, a, if a treatment for muscle disease is working is if you can track that, um, amount of fat within the muscle, usually is that a biomarker of, of the disease, uh, so, yeah, I see that uh, both as a powerful tool for for research, of course, mm -hmm. but then, yeah, I think as we're learning more about some of these uh, long uh, sort of diseases, ones that you know the the symptoms of which that are deadly, but they start maybe a decade or mm -hmm. or even two decades yeah. before, mm -hmm. right? Um, I'm I'm sort of picturing that this is one of the technologies that that will be available for people to be able to monitor themselves over exactly. time and yeah. see how their body is changing yeah. um, under different conditions, different diets, including. Exactly. Yeah. The, um, there is a nutritional aspect that I think our technology really uh, uh, kind of like intersects with because we have, you know, our data is about muscles and we uh, provide the information in a way that's functionally meaningful. Like how strong are your muscles? Which joints are stronger uh, based on our measurements of your muscle? But it's also essentially a body comp, a very detailed body composition assessment. How much muscle do you have? How much fat do you have? Um, where is that located? Which 
is also, you know, obviously has a lot uh, to do with the nutrition, not only your, your, um, you know, your health, uh, your activity, but then also your nutrition. So I think, again, like that's, that's another important direction. And, and this kind of essentially merges those two, like how is if you have some sort of intervention, intervention that involves both training and nutrition, how are those really kind of working in concert with each other? So I know in, in, any biomedical technology, there's the time it takes to get to market. It's very different than like your consumer products or right. your software. It's mm-hmm. um, it takes a long time to get something out, to get the feedback, to get mm-hmm. it validated. But um, Springbok's been around looks like about ten years, mm-hmm. so you're probably starting to see adoption and and mm-hmm. feedback. What's been sort of from the patient, uh, the provider perspective, are they finding it super easy to use? Like, what's been the reception and and how's the adoption going on? Yeah, um, it's definitely evolved a lot um, because, you know, you have this research project product thing and turning that into something that people can actually use is there's a lot, a lot in between, as you were alluding to. So we started out for a while even getting the technology to the point where it was even deliverable um, because it for a long time, it took a long time for us to go from MRI to the delivered information. It took a lot of manual processing time, like 50 or 60 hours of somebody's time. So that's not something that's commercializable. So we spent a lot of time essentially working on that problem uh, through grant funding. We were pretty dormant. We didn't have any customers or anything like that. We were kind of focused on the technology. Um, and uh, we our seat, uh, We hired our, our first employee who's still with us, uh, Shui Fang, who is a grad of the PhD program in BME. He led the way in developing an AI that solves this problem, essentially, because we had um, developed enough data that we could use to use a supervised learning of uh, an AI to train the computer to do what the human would do, essentially. Um, and so now we can once we got to the point where it was fast enough, so where we could deliver information in a reasonable time frame that didn't require like tons of people that was totally not scalable. Uh, and, uh, so that was the first thing. It was like even getting the technology at the point where it's possible. And then now how do you, what is the product that we give? Like, what is the product? It seems like it's on the one hand, like a very natural question, but on the other hand, like as an academic, it seems... I just hadn't realized that that was a question <laughs> until you really think about it. It's like, okay, what is it that you're giving? And uh, so, yeah, it's so essentially how do you deliver information? Uh, what's the form of it? Um, and, uh, you know, even back to like we had to, we developed um, through our software team a really exciting interactive platform where somebody gets their scan results back and they can interact with it. The provider can do that or the individual can too, actually. You log in and you can see your own. You actually see like a visualization of your own musculature. You have a bunch of, um, you have ability to manipulate it in a way to kind of see what's going on. Um, we also have a, we developed a way to do that like in a kind of static way. So it's more of a report that's formatted based on a lot of feedback from from early colleagues or um, consultants, um, early adopters, early partners gave us a lot of information. You've got to listen to hear how people will use it because they come up with things that you hadn't really thought about. You know, one of the early feedbacks we got was how we, uh, the Springbok score thing, this is how it came to be, is when we first were doing this, uh, we essentially, in order to kind of score muscles, we would say, like, we knew how, for example, big a muscle should be based on somebody's height and mass. And so then what we could do is say, okay, I know how how big it should be. Let me uh, tell you in uh, what's called a Z-score how far off you are from average. So if you're zero, you're right at average. If you're up, if you go up, you know, it goes you know, a number that's uh, one, it's in units of standard deviation. So if you're at one, that means you're one standard deviation bigger than the normal. And then, and so it's this weird number that's going to be positive or negative and it's got decimals and it's called a Z-score. <laughs> and so early on, we got feedback like, we don't know what this number means. Like, this means nothing to me. <laughs> and then we also got feedback that like athletes really like to know like they like between zero and a hundred. <laughs> so we essentially just transformed that into a Springbok score. So now a Z score of zero is a Springbok score of 50. 
and then we just scale at it and uh, figured out like the best way based on all of it. We had a lot of data to figure out what's the best way to map it on to something from zero to hundred, so it would work and be meaningful. And so uh, that's what we did. I can see how if you're in academics, the z-score is so commonly used right. and so ubiquitous that right. it would be the natural thing to go to. Right. And yet for the patient who Right. It, it might not be at all. Exactly. Unless they have a statistics uh, or data Backer, background. Yeah. But it's very valuable to be able to refer back to where it comes from because there is a lot of technology out there that doesn't have the scientific backing. And so when you start asking those questions, like, where does that come from? Like when we have a, a partner and a lot of people ask those questions because people are really informed and we can deliver our publications and say, this is where it comes from. And they're like, oh, cool. But um so it's empowering to have that background. It's like going from this to that is much more natural than coming up with something and then trying to find the scientific backing for it. That I think that would have not worked as well. <laughs> that yeah, makes sense. I agree with that. Yeah. So one, one of the things you mentioned is the role that having uh, somebody develop an AI for your company mm -hmm. played. And of course, today, as we're speaking, AI is a right. hot topic word, yeah. but I'm pretty sure that at the time when you're talking about Springbok Analytics, that would have been a word, uh, very, very niche word, not mm -hmm. so commonly understood. So you guys are, are, are on the pioneering edge of applying mm -hmm. artificial intelligence um, in medical applications. Right. So you probably are also looking into the future and thinking about how that's going to be growing within your company. What is sort of the, the vision that you have for AI in Springbok? Yeah, I mean, we are constantly pushing, uh, you know, essentially developing the AI further and further. Um, we have a team. We now have another um, fantastic uh, AI expert. Her name is Laura Riem, who's a PhD, actually in BME from uh, Marquette. She joined us, and um, now she and Shui, and there's a, a team within them that are continuing to, like, to push it forward. Um, it's actually really, this is one of those things that's so different about being in the startup world, how quickly technology can be developed. <laughs> um, it's kind of humbling sometimes to kind of re reflect on like the p pace of research sometimes versus, but so yeah, we we keep expanding it. It keeps getting better, smarter. We have more and more data to train. So obviously, uh, so this type of supervised learning or training, training uh, where you've essentially giving the AI the answer um, many times so then it gets smarter and more experienced, I guess, um, uh, the better it gets. So uh, that's something. It, but as you're doing that, there's still more uh, there's still more um, innovation that has to happen on the AI side to do that well. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of other elements that um, we've we've been developing kind of new other types of images that we process and other AIs to help with that because we can do more things now where we um, within a scan, so we've our base started with muscle, and then we added this fat quantification. But then we can also quantify um, injuries by looking at a scan that that is focused on the edema within muscle. So then we can give a more quantitative assessment of how injured something is. Um, we can also we've also kind of transformed the product to different. Uh, applications like we we have one now for the shoulder where instead of um going from a scan that is actually like the the base scan for our technology is something it's a kind of a protocol that we tell an imaging center here's how you do it and it's very fast and simple and you can do it on any mri but you have to do that one um for the most part i mean sometimes we can work with other types of data but uh and we also develop things where we can just leverage um, types of MRIs that are, have already been collected clinically. So, for example, uh, for the rotator cuff, um, if somebody is a candidate for rotator cuff repair, they'll get an MRI. Um, everybody will get an MRI. And actually, the um, clinicians are looking in the MRI to assess the quality of the muscles. Mm -hmm. um, so that presented an opportunity for us to say, OK, can we adapt our AI to work off of that type of image to quantify those muscles in the way that the clinician would. And so that's been exciting. We've developed that. Um, now we're on a phase two SBIR grant from the NIH to test that out, to see if it protect, if we can predict outcomes of, of surgery based on measurements from the MRI, because that would essentially give the clinicians a more quantitative way to figure out if somebody is a good candidate for surgery or not. So hopefully improving the outcomes of those surgeries, because they're pretty 
pretty hard to go through. Yeah, that would be a really great impact is just better assessment and then maybe over time even exactly. some guidance or additional information right. that gives the clinician a better opportunity right. to yeah, perform could a better surgery. Exactly. Or even um, it can also suggest good PT, um, give some information back to a, a PT, whether it be before or after the surgery. I love that. Well, your lab at UVA does... Uh, an even broader set of research than Springbok, though Springbok yeah. is doing whole body muscle right. scans, so yeah. there's a pretty broad uh, scope of work there. And one of the things that really struck me as I was uh, reading about your work is that you have students uh, that are working on kind of cell mm -hmm. models, and then you have like whole muscle modeling, and then you have the entire human body mm -hmm. uh, model. And so there's this whole from micro to macro uh, coverage of muscles that you do. So one of the thoughts that I had is just how does the how does the ideation from one translate to the other? And how does covering all of that scope from the micro to the macro actually contribute to, to the flow of work and research in your team? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Uh, so um, we're, for the most part, the ideation, um, for the most part in our lab has to do with an interest in a specific clinical problem or, you know, problem in general. It could be related to human performance, um, but, and, uh, and kind of a biological question that kind of like it goes hand in hand with that. And we've found over the years that the types of questions that we pose aren't necessarily just tied to one scale. <laughs> I mean, usually as scientists, we reduce things enough so that we can just look at the one thing um, because, you know, it's a lot. But we found that um, for uh, it's really good to understand and address the problem for multiple scales and, and perspectives. Uh, one example is we have an interest in um, using modeling and imaging to help better understand or come up with new ideas for treatment for muscle, muscle disease. And so, uh, for example, Duchenne muscular dystrophy is a, is a very good example high clinical need, but then also a disease that is really micro, macro or multi-scale. It's a disease that affects um, proteins in muscle. So it's a deficiency of a particular protein. It's called dystrophin. Um, and as a result, muscles get weaker, they degenerate, you have impairments in movement that you can observe on the macro scale. So we're really interested in how to kind of bridge those scales, because I think to some degree, some of the lack of understanding is because there are lots of different scales involved. Um, you know, one of the things that we got really interested in muscle disease is that uh, not all muscles progress in the same way. They don't, um, some muscles get very um, damaged and progressed very early while other muscles last much longer, like they'll stay healthy for much longer. And the question of why, because all the muscles have the same disease, all of the muscles lack the same protein, but why is it some are preserved than others? And um, so my lab was able to um, produce some new ideas to introduce to the field that it has to do with the way people move. Um, but you had to kind of integrate the perspective on what leads muscles to be damaged and the perspective of how human movement works and which muscles are used in what way to be able to kind of come up with that concept. Um, so uh, I think th it's just an example of why I think it's exciting and meaningful to, to be able to address problems for multi-scales. And I think in the lab, it's cool because people learn a lot more and you can look at your own research differently. If you've also have a neighbor, like for example, if you're studying muscle at the whole level and you have a neighbor who's like diving the details in the micro scale, that gives you some perspective on what, what it is that you're doing and what it might mean and what are the limitations of it and what are the implications. So, um, and I also just think it's really cool connecting dots. Like I've always been drawn to that. I think a lot of biomedical engineers are like bringing together different concepts and disciplines, um, kind of connecting pieces. <laughs> That's so interesting. Your your lab is M3 or is it M cubed? Um, you know, it's really was conceived as M cubed, but we usually say M3. It's a little easier to say. So. And what does the three M stand for? It stands for. Uh, um, actually, I'll tell you what it first stood for and what it stands for now. So when I first started my lab, um, having been in mechanical engineering, my PhD research was developing new 
biomechanical models of muscle. So like that was my, that was my shtick. It still kind of is. So <laughs> one trick pony, I guess. Um, and I was very much focused on the mechanics. I figuring out the mechanical engineering uh, tools needed to model human muscle. Like that's a fair amount of our research was, it's called constitutive modeling and engineering mechanics. So, um, cause it's not, you know, I was trying to apply principles that were normally applied to like concrete to <laughs> muscle. <laughs> so it was a lot more complicated, a lot more math involved to like do. A, so, so I was focused on the muscle mechanics. So when I first started, and I started here in mechanical and aerospace engineering, uh, my lab was in mechanical engineering. So we were first called the multi-scale muscle mechanics lab. So M3, and that's a little easier to say than what it is now. So about um, six years after I started here, um, through a you know a number of um, kind of serendipitous things, I ended up shifting my lab to be in BME while being having an appointment still in mechanical engineering. So I started with mechanical, with a courtesy appointment in BME, and then I essentially switched that. And um, a few years later, a few um, we had moved the lab from still doing muscle modeling, but we more and more started integrating more biology and physiology in the models. We realized that. When we model muscle, muscle is such a dynamic structure. It doesn't just always stay the same. We wanted to capture that if we wanted to predict, because we wanted to do things like predict how a muscle might progress in a disease or how it might respond to an injury and things like that. So you need more than just the mechanics. You need to, like, how cells respond. Um, they respond to lots of things. And so we had more and more physiology. So a few students, uh, former students came into my office and they said, Sylvia, I think we need to rename our lab. <laughs> I was like, oh, this sounds cool. I love it when like, I just love new ideas like that. And they said, how about instead of mechanics, we call it mechanophysiology because we're integrating mechanics and physiology, which is different than there's something called mechanobiology, which is a lot more how does mechanics influence how like cells behave? Mm -hmm. But that's not really what we were doing. We're studying muscle function and, and physiology kind of integrated together <laughs> as a whole. So, and I think the word physiology represents that kind of holistic view of something. Um, so that's where, so now it's multi-scale muscle mechanophysiology lab. So and it's even more so you got to just say M3. <laughs> the the multi-scale refers to what we just talked about, right. that you guys work uh, yeah. both at the cellular level mm -hmm. and all the way to the human body. Okay, so this is a question I um, personally want to know. So you're an expert in muscles and me and mechanophysiology. Yes, yeah. and you can be an expert in the thing, that you the name that, of something you just come up with yourself. <laughs> I love yeah. that. And, you know, I think a lot of people of, of the various body systems, probably the musculoskeletal system, people are to some degree familiar mm -hmm. with I mean, some systems in our body. I think like the lymph more, system, I right. think very few people could yeah, describe it's more what nebulous. Yeah. We use our muscles all the time. Yeah. We know we do. Yeah. We can, we can yeah. see them, but right. uh, what, is, what are some things that you've learned studying them so deeply that you want, you would want everybody in the world to know about their muscles? Mm. What should everybody know? Well, you should use them. <laughs> you know, the phrase use it or lose it, like for sure. Um, uh, using muscles is uh, is important for their health. Um, I think the other one, I think, I guess, and I don't know if, I think everybody should know this, that we use, there's a lot more muscles than we realize. Um, pretty much muscles are responsible for everything <laughs> in our body <laughs> in terms of a function, uh, we muscles, we need for breathing. Um, and so the diaphragm muscle and there's other muscles. And, and it turns out like, if you go, if you're in an ICU and you need to rely on a respirator, those muscles get weak very quickly because you're no longer using them. It's a huge problem in, in medicine is actually how to recover those breathing muscles because they're so important and we need them, but when you're not using them, they, um, they atrophy. So, um, just kind of an appreciation for all, um, all, even like in the eye, there's, you know, a lot of our eye function is because of muscles. And, um, so they're very important. <laughs> All right. Use it or lose it. Very important. Every yes. part of the body. Yeah. Maybe I'll come up with another, oh, there's another really cool thing. Um, and this isn't something that I discovered, but I think is really kind of valuable. Uh, actually, no, there's two things. One is something that a, a, a partner is has 
discover, like a colleague. So one of them is the, this concept of muscle memory. Um, so people use that kind of term loosely, like, okay, oh, you know, I used to, like, for example, I used to dance. Well, I have muscle memory about dance. That's, that's um, more like motor coordination, really. Muscle memory is actually a thing. And what that is, is that if you exercise your muscle, you hypertrophy it, you make it get bigger, stronger. It turns out when you're doing that, um, your uh, your fibers in your muscle are remodeling in a way where it's they're adding it's called nuclei, the, like the main machinery inside a cell that like produces all the proteins in the cell, to, like does all the things like manages the cell. And it, you end up uh, if you do enough exercise on the muscle, use it enough, you add those nuclei. Um, so it has more, essentially has more capacity. And then perhaps you are bed rested for a while or you kind of like couch potato it for a little bit. Turns out that those nuclei stay. So if you go back and you exercise again, your muscle will grow faster because you've done it before. And because those nuclei are there ready to like start churning new proteins and doing new stuff. So that's called, that's muscle memory is the fact that you can use your muscle, make it bigger. Perhaps you take a break for a little bit you come back, it'll be, it'll come back faster. So it's a good reason to exercise, I think, because it's a short and a long-term benefit. Is that one of the things that happens in strength training where like the first time you try to lift something in a particular way, I don't know, you, you're like, you just feel like weak sauce. You can't get any of it lifted. And then you come back like a week later and suddenly you can like go up, I don't know, 10, 20 pounds. Mm -hmm. And you're like, where did the strength come from? Last time was a real struggle. Yeah. I think to some degree relates to that. There's another phenomenon that happens when you're learning a new uh, when you're strength training or and especially when it's something that you don't normally do. And usually like if you started lifting weights, that's something that you haven't done much. So you actually you first have benefits because your brain learns how to use your muscle in that way because you're not used to like your your uh, your you know, nervous system hasn't like been doing that in a while. So it takes a little while for it to adjust. And then so you first get gains that are simply based on like your nervous system. But that's that. So that's like memory, so memory. And that's yeah. different from muscle memory. Exactly. And the muscle memory is the muscle itself has like memory of what it's done before, just biologically from these nuclei. So I think that's a cool concept because, you know, as somebody that like sometimes I have like good periods of going to the gym and working out and then sometimes I just get too busy, you know, like kids and two jobs and all the different things um and so but it's nice to know like at that time that I was going a lot like I come back a little later and it's you know my muscles will remember (laughs) um and the the only other one that's really interesting I think is um and it relates back to this nutrition and this is a colleague um uh in uh Belgium who is doing this really interesting um uh, strength training study uh, where, and this pa- this is uh, work that his student has presented. I think it's still not published yet, but it's been presented to the world. So I feel I can share it. Um, where they had people exercise, um, do resistance training over a period of time. And then they measured, you know, how does the resistance training affect their muscle? And one of their questions was like, how frequently you should, you know, two times or three times a day. It turns out that doesn't matter. Um, Your muscles that you're targeting do the same thing. But the cool thing, so they were using the Springbok technology to measure all the muscles in their legs. And they ended up measuring not only the muscles they were targeting, but they were measuring muscles they weren't targeting, like other muscles. So it turns out that sometimes, like for everybody, the muscles you target get bigger. Makes sense. But for some people or many of them, the muscles you weren't targeting got smaller. Um, so it was like a re, it's like a redistribution of muscle. And, you know, it wasn't really controlled or designed for this, but they did measure protein and caloric intake. And the degree to which the other muscles got smaller was based on nutrition. So people that had more nutritional intake, calories, protein, didn't experience that atrophy of other muscles, while people that had more of a limited diet had this sort of like somebody steals from somebody else kind of thing within their muscles. So I think that's really interesting and and something that I feel like even, you know, it's that in and of itself is something for people to be aware of. Like if you're really trying to strength train, you have to increase your, uh, your intake 
or else you're going to steal from somebody else. <laughs> well, definitely a protein intake has been a hot topic mm -hmm. recently as well. I think yeah. it, it, from a variety of different fields, right. I see it yeah, coming yeah. from a wellness, from mm -hmm. uh, particularly women aging and, mm -hmm. and our loss of muscles. Mm -hmm. So um, that's a very, very cool thing to learn. Gr mm -hmm. Great to hear we get to hear a little bit about this study. Yeah, yeah. I want to dive in uh, into another uh area that you're you're passionate about right now, which is uh, advocating for including women in a better way and researching in research, biomedical research, medical mm -hmm. trials, et cetera. Can you describe what the essence of the problem is? Because I think when I heard about this, I was just surprised. Like I never even thought this would be a problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's, it's, I mean, the essence of the problem is that, you know, science is based on the past, right? Like what people, what we know is based on what's been studied, right? Like, it makes sense. <laughs> and, um, you know, because research is pushing the edge of knowledge. So as people have pushed, we just, what we know is where people pushed and what edge. And in um, biomechanics, and I think a lot of other fields are this way, most of the edge of knowledge was based on studies done on men. And, um, and so <laughs> that's what we knew. And the challenge is that, you know, it's probably there's a I mean, there's probably a lot of like societal cultural things that we could go through about why that is. Um, and I guess I'm not I mean, they're interesting, but I'm not particularly interested in knowing why that is. It's more like we need to solve that because um, there's so many things about our physiology that we know are different between male and females. But much of what we know in the field is based on the studies of males. So whether it's we just assume it's the same or we can't use that information. Um, so, uh, so yeah, that's, that's the essence of the problem is like a lot of the data that exists and the knowledge is based on, on research. And, and it's so muddied because that wasn't necessarily um, an issue that oftentimes, like even myself, I will look back and, you know, based on papers that I've read before and just not realize like, oh, or, you know, even based on animal studies, Oh, that was all male rats. Like, and so we're making a we're making a generalization of this finding in this paper about this thing about muscle, and that thing was only based on males. So how often is that true? Um, it's a little overwhelming sometimes when you think about it. But you know, and, and scientifically, this is where the interesting thing happens. Like, scientifically, like you're you know you're taught. Like, my kids are in science now. They're taught to only have one variable in a, in a, in a experiment, right? Like that's how you do science. You have, um, you know, you try to control for everything you can, can and have one independent variable. So then you can understand what's affecting the outcome. Well, when it comes to male, female, like if intrinsically, if you're going to have both and you're obviously studying something else, like now you intrinsically have two. <laughs> and so your, your experiment becomes a lot more complicated uh, you need more samples, you need more, like more everything. So it, I think it's understandable, but we just have to address that. And so to some degree, like, uh, so I have a project, um, the the way this has kind of in, come into our world is that, um, is really to do with modeling. So a lot of, um, so we do modeling of muscle and of the musculoskeletal system. The field as a whole has, um, has actually had a really good um, approach of sharing models and data, like somebody um, develops a model and we have this really nice platform. Uh, it's called OpenSim that where you can share models. So there's a model of the lower extremity that um, was developed a long time ago initially um, uh, by Scott Delp, who is my former PhD advisor that has kind of evolved over the years and people have improved upon it, but it's based on the anatomy of a man. Uh, and it's one man. And, and then with added aggregated other data that maybe averages between males and females, maybe it's male data, like it's kind of like a mishmash of lots of data, but um, has no real acknowledgement of the differences between male and female kind of entrenched. So, and that model is used for everything because once somebody builds a model, it takes a lot and somebody shares it, that's good. But then now you're kind of per essentially perpetuating the issue. And it takes a lot of work to make a real model that's correct. And um, that's why people share date models. So we just decided to address that head on. And so we have a project that is this main purpose of the project is to create 
sex specific models that we will share with the community so that people don't have to do that anymore. <laughs> so it's not like mishmashed, aggregated. Now, in muscles, I you know, we, we male and female physiology, you can usually tell just um, visually the differences in, in mass, but there's other differences, not just the size of the muscle. Mm -hmm. um, that's important. What are some examples of other things that m most people probably don't know is actually different between uh, male and female muscles? Yeah. Um, well, even size, it's interesting. So yes, like, um, you know, I think what and when most of the world, like people often use this phrase, like a, a woman isn't just a small man. And, and that's how modeling has assumed it. You just like scale it down and all scale it down. Well, actually, even the distribution of muscle is different in male versus female. So uh, like relative to body size, some muscles are bigger in women and some muscles are bigger in men. Like they have different kind of like base strengths. And where that comes from is another set of interesting questions. Um, but that in and of itself. So even with that, like where the distribution of our muscle uh, exists. Um, also, m women do tend to have slightly more of that fat infiltration in their muscles. Um, uh, just it's not like in a healthy individual, it's not a significant enough thing, I don't think to affect their function, but it's base, base it's there. Um, uh, and then the other things, part of the part, part of our project is actually to really kind of get at that, like we're looking kind of in more detail about, um, so something called muscle architecture is where, so you have a muscle, you know, it's like a, that, like this. And it turns out when you look inside each muscle, um, you know, the things that generate force in the muscle that, you know, are allow us to move, those are fibers. And how each muscle packs those fibers in the volume differs. This is called muscle architecture, essentially kind of how is the muscle designed to, to do its function. And so we're measuring that with our MRI techniques. And so we're interested in how that differs between male and female. Um, you know, the other things that we're, we're getting the musculoskeletal system. So obviously the skeletal system is different. Um, you know, like the hip, uh, the pelvic anatomy differs, lots of other things. So we're interested in how that impacts the leverage of muscles. Um, Cause the you know a muscle generates force but in order to order to move you actually rotate joints and the way um the thing that impacts that is the um leverage or the moment arm of a, of a muscle and so we're interested in like once we put it all together we'll be able to tell like what's the leverage of muscles in male and female and how that differs then we're also intentionally studying uh women and men of a range of heights and masses so that we don't just assume that everybody's like a scaled version of somebody else, like that people shapes and sizes differ across people. So we can start to address that too. Have you, uh, do you have any collaborators on this project and um, are other, other research groups starting to pick this up and starting to uh, develop new methods to make sure that they are differentiating in their research, not making assumptions, yeah. or at the very least not aggregating mm -hmm. data into, into one, one thing. thing yeah. 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 No, we're not the only ones for sure. And that, I mean, that's exciting. Um, uh, you know, in terms of this specific project, we have a couple. Um, we're collaborating with uh, Sean Russell, who's a professor here, primarily out of orthopedic surgery. Um, he's an expert on measurements of human movement and models of human movement. And so we've, since um, that piece is like kind of plugging in with like whole macro level uh, movement, which I would say is not, you know, we, we're sort of all the skills in between. And so he's been a great collaborator to bring in um, expertise on how to measure. So we're, we're doing in this project, we're doing MRI, uh, we're doing a, a whole battery of strength testing and we're doing uh, measurements of gait biomechanics and all people, like a hundred different people, <laughs> male, 50, male, 50, female. So which are, it's a pretty intense experiment. So we're collaborating with him on, on pieces of that. Um, and then we also have a collaborator um, at Virginia Tech where uh, her name is Robin Queen and she runs a, a, a lab where she's been really interested in sex differences for a long time and exploring it in different ways. And so she's um, going to be leveraging our models to uh, use them to interpret the uh, outcome of um, landing experiments in males and females. So um, as you probably know, like uh, women are much more um, uh, susceptible to ACL injury. Um, and so there's a lot of interest in like in the kind of biomechanics basis of that. And so she has this experiment to look at kind of the stability of the knee in these particular situations. 
And interestingly, she's she's an experimentalist who hasn't been doing much modeling. And she will say it's because she knows the models are all for males. So she's we brought her on as a collaborator to essentially be a user of the models as somebody that, okay, now that we can give you these sex specific models, you know, are they like, how would you use them essentially? Because we have some ideas, but, you know, it's just ours. So we want to make sure that what we're building and, and doing is something that's relevant to the rest of the community. One of the things that comes through from talking first about Springbok and now kind of to this new initiative, and I think you got an NIH grant to support this as well, mm-hmm. is that you have translational projects that are on the commercial scale, but this one is a, it's a translational project because it's you're there influencing medicine. You're trying to get more better data so mm-hmm. that, but it's it's not necessarily commercial, but it's nonetheless translating into practice and mm-hmm. impact for patients long term. Mm-hmm. So something really interesting about how you think and translate your solutions into into real impact. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I mean, it's, it makes it a very um, worthwhile to know that what you're doing is meaningful to somebody else. And, you know, I will say that um, I think uh, working on things like this draws really excellent students because um, especially this generation of students really wants to understand the impact of what they're doing. They're willing to work really hard. Um, really bright, really worrying, but they want to make sure that what they're doing is actually going to amount to something. (laughs) And I appreciate that. And so um, I think that's one benefit I have, I guess, of of working on things like this is that um, you can really attract some amazing students to come, come work on the problems. Well, speaking of students, I see that you're teaching everything from intro to engineering to finite element analysis. You get students, graduate students, undergraduate students, and you've seen this evolve for so long. What is the kind of direction of the field and what are the students looking for more to do, like new directions in biomedical engineering? Uh, That's a good question. I mean, in my slice, I think a lot of students have gotten really interested in women's health. Um, That's like an area of bioengineering that I will say was, you know, there were like a select few people that were working on it for a long time. And I give them a lot of credit because for a long time, people weren't giving them much. They they didn't have that much, I want to say, credibility or acknowledgement of what they're doing. Um, But that's changed so much recently. And um, I think that's... um, a lot of students are really excited to work on on women's health. And it's not just women, actually, um, because I think, you know, we have some major problems. And, and, you know, the the slice of that that I work on, I think, is important. But there's some really bigger issues related to women's health, uh, reproductive health, recovery from pregnancy, um, pelvic floor disorders that are really understudied and like real opportunities for impact. So, I mean, that's one that I think I see like very much um uh, an area of, of growth and interest. And um, another one that's generally, I think, bioengineering is uh, really, especially, I mean, I would say our department, but many is um, kind of coming to terms with the concept of health disparities in general and realizing that what we're doing has plays, can really impact mm-hmm. health disparities in general. You know, we really have to think about that from the beginning of like of what we're doing and how it's accessible and what it means and who we're studying and all the different things to make sure that what we're doing is ultimately hopefully going to benefit everybody the human condition as a whole not just like one little snippet and what about um i know with the new data science department doing data science school i feel like the work that you're doing with Mm -hmm. ai there's a lot of opportunities for collaboration how is have have you been able to sort of integrate some of the students from there or work with some of the new faculty? Um, yeah, we, we have a few colleagues that are in data science and BME, and that's been really exciting. Um, I think it's uh, a lot of, you know, I think the thing that I've seen most now is like our students have access to the, all these fantastic data science classes, which is so important. I mean, that's what I tell all the new students, like, if you had to do spend your time taking any any types of classes, take data science. <laughs> I wish I could. I wish I had the time <laughs> to kind of like learn vicariously through them. Um, so uh, yeah, no, I think that's that's been really exciting. Where do you see this field? Because you're doing computational modeling, so you're working with a lot of data. Mm-hmm. Where do you see the development of this field of data science potentially contributing to the work Springbok or your lab? Ah, uh, yeah. I mean, I think 
ultimately, uh, we're all like Springbok's a good example, but in all of research, we're amassing more and more data, like just more technologies, whether it be um, new imaging techniques or now like we do a lot of work. Um, we do some animal work studying muscle injury and regeneration and things like that. And so we use a lot of uh, microscopy. And now there's more and more technologies that allow us to measure more and more from my, like sections of muscle. But it's like, now what? <laughs> what are we going to do with all that information? How do we process it? What do we learn from it? And um, so that's definitely we've been leveraging more and more um, kind of advanced data science methods to make something out of that uh, that data. And, and Springbok, same thing. Like we've developing more and more data. And so learning what to do with it is now like the opportunity. I like to think of it's a challenge and an opportunity. All challenges are opportunities. Yeah, I can see that um, for speeding up research, being able to apply something from here to something else there, the this could really, uh, and, and especially multi difficult experiments, you have multiple variables, mm -hmm. having uh, that expertise available mm -hmm. uh, would be really helpful to mm -hmm. speeding up that research mm -hmm. and, and or making sense of much more complicated experiments. Exactly. Yep. That's fantastic. Dr. Blumker, is there any kind of studies or, or any research that you're doing right now that you would want people to take a closer look at? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, this project I described, um, this uh, sex differences, we're doing the MRI and strength testing and everything. Uh, we're recruiting subjects. Um, we need a lot more. And we're looking across um, the inclusion criteria is from age 18 to 49, uh, with no significant injury in the last six months or um, any if somebody's had a really significant implant that's hard with the MRI. But um, so we're recruiting people, um, especially in the 30 and 40 range. So as you can imagine, being in a university, it's a lot easier to recruit people in the 20s. Uh, so if 30s and 40s, uh, we'd love, please come uh, reach out. Uh, and there's a, a link on our website, but there, there's a, a different uh, flyers we have to describe the study and more and see if you're interested. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, we'll post a link in the show notes, so please check it out. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much for your time. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for listening to Biomedical Frontiers, stories with innovators in healthcare. My name is David Chen, and I am the Managing Director of the Wallace H. Coulter Center for Translational Research at the University of Virginia. Our mission is to help bring promising new biomedical research and technology into the hands of the provider and the patient. If you found this episode valuable, please let us know by subscribing, following, or sharing. You can learn more about our promising translational research projects on our website. See links in the show notes. <laughs>